What's going on everyone? Harris Rubenstein here for NBA. Now, it's not quite NBA draft season, but March Madness is right around the corner. So, we are going to give you our first 2019 NBA mock draft, or at least our first one in six months. So, without further ado, let's start at number one overall. Now, one other thing, the draft order is based off of the current standings in the NBA, not a randomized lottery, so it's just by record. Don't freak out if the Knicks don't have number one overall, which they don't because the Phoenix Suns currently have the worst record in the NBA. And of course, at number one overall, the Phoenix Suns are going to select Zion Williamson. So the greatest thing about Zion for me is not that, you know, he can dunk really well or that he's an unreal athlete, is that he's as good of a basketball player as the hype suggests. He can do everything. He's a decent jump shooter. He can work out of the pick and roll. He's great out of the post. He can rebound. He can score around the rim. He can shoot a little bit from the outside as well. He's a great defender, can defend multiple positions. The advanced statistics absolutely love him. Win shares, player efficiency rating, real plus minus, box scores. Like, they all love him. And as of right now, Zion Williamson, before the injury, was putting up one of the best college seasons in the history of basketball based off of efficiency numbers. So while all the numbers suggest that Zion is going to be great, we have to wonder what his fit is going to be like in the NBA. He could end up being a generational prospect like, you know, like a Patrick Ewing or a Charles Barkley, or he could just end up being an outstanding athlete who plays basketball like a Sean Kemp. And as of right now, that's kind of the way I'm leaning. I think he's going to end up more Sean Kemp than he is Charles Barkley or Patrick Ewing. I think he's going to be a fantastic player. I think he's going to be a cornerstone for any franchise. But saying that he's going to end up being one of the greatest players in basketball history, that pushes it a little bit for me just because I'm not sure what exactly his position is and what the future of the league is going to look like. Because if he can't shoot, if he cannot shoot at an NBA level, I wonder how successful he will really end up being. But the question right now is much different. Wills or should Zion Williamson ever play at Duke again after the whole blowing up the shoe incident or the knee injury? Personally, I say yes. I don't think it's a should. I think, A, he will, but I just think he needs more college coaching. I don't think that's a bad thing. Sure, he's an outstanding NBA prospect, and he's going to go number one overall, but I don't see the bad, I don't see the, the downside of coming back and playing with Coach K in March Madness. I'd love to see Zion get a little big game experience. I'd love to see him actually go up against some other elite NBA prospects. The only time that we really saw it this year was against Gonzaga and a couple of the other games, and they lost to Gonzaga. So I want to see Zion against some big, bigger and better competition. He's the number one overall pick no matter what, uh, no matter what, excuse me. And I know that the the injury risk is there, but I mean, John Wall just tore his Achilles stepping out of the shower. This stuff can happen anytime. I'd love to see Zion back on the floor to play for Duke, but it is still his decision at the end of the day. Let me know in the comment section below what Zion Williams should, should do. Let's go to number two, and here are the New York Knicks. They don't get Zion Williamson, but they end up with a fantastic player either way. They get R.J. Bear, the shooting guard from Duke, one of the best players in college basketball this season. His outside shot has been a little bit worse than what I would have expected, but all the older overall numbers, he has played up to the par that I expected him to. Now, I would like to see that elite jump that I was expecting for R.J. Barrett coming out of high school and going into college. Sure, he is averaging 23-7 and seven a game, which is spectacular, and the reason I have him at number two overall. But in the game against UNC when Zion goes down, that's a game where I want to see R.J. Barrett step up, come out for Duke, and possibly even win them that game. For me, I think that R.J. Barrett, despite his smoothness and his explosiveness and athleticism, I think he can be a little bit too passive on the offensive side of the ball. I want to see him take charge in March Madness and really make this Duke team his with or without Zion on the team. He's a fantastic player. He's a ton of talent. One of the highest ceilings of any player on this team. There's a reason why my player comp for RJ Bear is Paul George. But for me, I want to see that next elite step of development for RJ Bear over the last month here or so for Duke. He's a fantastic player, but for me, I want to see another jump. A little bit of surprise here, number three. Maybe not the guy you would expect, but I mostly have Jared Culver at three because of the team that is drafting at number three. John Morant from Murray State is actually the number three player on my big board, but 
the, the Cavs aren't going to take John Morant because they drafted Colin Sexton at number eight overall last year. So they're not going to take another point guard. They're going to go with the shooting guard here, Jared Culver. For me, I don't think he has a crazy high ceiling, but he's going to end up being a very, very good NBA player. He's going to be consistent. He'll stick in the NBA for 13, 14 years. A CJ McCollum, DeMar DeRozan kind of player. I don't think he'll ever reach the heights of a, of a Donovan Mitchell or, or even you know, a, a James Harden or anything like that, but he's going to end up being a very consistent, quality NBA player, very coachable, very mature player. I know a couple of people that know him personally. He's a very, very nice guy as well. I think Jared Culver is going to be a great fit next to Colin Sexton if he ends up with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Again, maybe a little bit high for Culver, but I think the fit here warrants him at number three. Let's go to number four. It's John ja Morant, the point guard from Murray State. One of the most athletic point guards I have ever seen come out of college, and I think the Bulls will be an outstanding landing spot for him. For me, I think John ja Morant's NBA success is almost completely reliant on what team he gets drafted by. If he goes to like the Sun, well, actually, I think the Suns would be a pretty good fit also, but if he goes to a team like the Grizzlies that has an established point guard and he's fighting for minutes and shots, I think it won't work as well. For me, I think John Morant needs to have the ball in his hands in order to be successful. He's not a great off-ball shooter. He's not a great catching shooter as well. I think he's a guy who needs the ball in his hands. I'm not saying he is Derrick Rose, but his play style is very similar of Derrick Rose. The explosiveness, the athleticism, the ability to score around the rim, the elite shot making as well, and playmaking ability. He has it all. He's like a Donovan Mitchell but for point guards. It just, it really comes down to what team ends up drafting him that will decide his NBA success. I think the Bulls will be a fantastic, fantastic landing spot. They are desperate for a point guard next to Zach Levine. Let's go to number five, the Atlanta Hawks. They get Cam Reddish, the small forward from Duke. Has not had the season I expected him to, especially in the offensive side of the ball. He can't shoot at all. His shot has been so, so bad this year for Duke. He's great around the rim. He's a fantastic two-way player but he needs a ton of polish and he needs time to develop in the NBA. And that's one thing I want to stress about a lot of these guys. None of them, 0% of the guys that we are talking about on this list are finished product. All of them are going to need college, or all of them are going to need NBA coaching. They're all going to need time to develop. That's one thing about this year's class that's different from past years. There is no Wendell Carter Jr. There is no safe pick like a DeAndre Ayton that is instantly going to come in and just be a fantastic NBA player. All of these guys are going to need time to develop, and I think that's one of the more interesting parts of the 2019 NBA draft. So that's our top five. Zion Williamson, RJ Barrett, Jared Culver, John ja Morant, and Cam Reddish. I think that top five is what you're going to see. Maybe the order of those five guys ends up switching around, but to me, those are the guys that you're going to see picked in the top five this year. Let's go to number six. This one's a little bit high, but I think that Romeo Langford, some team, the Grizzlies in this case, are gonna end up falling in love with him. Now, his biggest problem, he can't shoot threes at all. He shoots like 27% from outside the arc. But you teach him to shoot, teach him to shoot threes, he's already a decent mid-range scorer, and he's already good around the hoop as well. He's actually shooting 45% from the floor on the season, which tells me he's very good in the mid-range. He shoots over 50% there. He just can't shoot threes at all, which great thing for the NBA. There's never been a better time to teach somebody how to shoot threes. I think Romeo Langford will be a really good guy for them to bring in and work next to Jaron Jackson Jr. If they want to trade Mike Conley, on draft night, they can go right ahead. But I think Langford would be a great guy in number six to build around. I know he hasn't had the season that some people were expecting him to have. But for me, some team is going to fall in love with him in the draft process. They're going to fall in love with his athleticism and his defensive ability at the combine. I think Langford is one of the best high school prospects that we had this past season. And I think an NBA team is going to end up picking him pretty high. But if you guys want to bet on everything in the NBA, including who could go number one overall, there's only one place to do it, and that's with our sportsbook partner, BetDSI. Head to chatsports.com slash bet. Use that promo code NBA120 for 120% deposit bonus. Let's go to number seven. It's Jackson Hayes, the center from Texas. For me, this is where Jackson Hayes would get selected right now. But he's probably one of my top candidates for guys who could end up falling. I also think that Bruno Fernando, the center from Maryland, will end up getting drafted higher than Jackson Hayes. But as of right now, 
Hayes would end up getting picked higher. Every single year, we always get the high field goal percentage guy and high defensive ability big. Those guys always end up going in the top 10. At least one of them usually ends up going in the top 10. Whether it's a Willie Cauley Stein or, or a Bam Adebayo. Uh, you know, we've, we've had multiple of these bigs. Or Miles Turner. We've always had these kind of big men go high in drafts because teams get, you know, obsessed with the potential that a defensive big could bring to their team. In the Wizards case, Dwight Howard has done literally nothing for the team this year. John Wall's not coming back until halfway through the season. I would have given them a small forward to replace Otto Porter with, but I don't trust the Wizards' decision making, and I think they'll end up taking a defensive big, and to me, Jackson Hayes would be their guy. Let's go to number eight, the Atlanta Hawks back on the board, this time getting the pick from the Dallas Mavericks in the Luka Doncic, Trey Young trade from last year. For me, Keldon Johnson would be a fantastic and safe player for them to pick. Consistent defender, can hit the three. One of the truer three and D guys that we have in the draft this year. My player comp for him is Trevor Ariza. I think he'd be a great player for the Hawks to bring in. You put him behind Tari and Prince on the bench. Maybe you start him next to John Collins. Really depends on what the Hawks end up doing with that first draft pick. But now they have Cam Reddish and, Cam, uh, and Keldon Johnson, two fantastic young wings that they can mix and match on their lineups. That's what the Hawks need right now. They have their two guards in Kevin Herter and Trey Young. They have their guys down low with John Collins, and they'll probably draft another one as well. Now you need to stack your wings. They have Tari and Prince, and I think someone like a Keldon Johnson and Cam Reddish would be two fantastic players to fit next to Trey Young. But who has the brighter future? Give me an H for the Hawks. Give me an M for the Mavericks. I bring this up, obviously, because the Hawks have the Mavericks pick from this year. I'm going to take the Mavs just because I love Luka Doncic, and I was completely 100% right about how good he was going to be in the NBA, and all you haters out there were completely 100% wrong. I'm going to throw up the M for Mavericks, but if you think it's Trey Young and the Hawks, that is also a good answer. Let's go to number nine. The Pelicans finally, finally, finally get the point guard that they've been hoping and dreaming for. They get Darius Garland, the point guard from Vanderbilt. It is a shame that he got injured. He's a really, really fun player to watch, an outstanding skill set. I love the effort that this guy shows on the court, very similar to me to an Eric Bledsoe, but he's a dynamic score around the rim. He's a great shooter as well, has a really, really refined offensive game for a guy his age. For me, the injury, I'm not putting too much of a worry into it. Sounds to me like he got injured, got a little bit scared, and just said, I'm done with this season. I'm getting ready for the draft. He's not Zion Williamson. He's not playing for Duke. He's playing for Vanderbilt. No offense, Commodores, but... If Darius Garland gets a little bit injured and he wants to prep for the draft, makes sense to do so. And if you're the Pelicans and Garland's on the board, you snatch him up instantly. He's going to be a really fun player to pair next to Drew Holiday. Let's go to number 10, Nasir Little. Disappointing season for him. Hasn't gotten the, the minutes that I wanted him to get with the UNC Tar Heels, but he's a fantastic athlete. Just needs a ton of time to develop. And for me, there's no perfect team and no perfect coach for him to go to than the Miami Heat and Eric Spolster. If there's a guy who's going to be able to coach up Nasir Little and turn him into the player that I know that he can be, I think Eric Spolster is 100% the correct coach for him. He's done it with so many different guys. He's doing it right now, Bam Adebayo. He did already with Hassan Whiteside. He's turned Justice Winslow into a really, really effective NBA player as well. I think Nasir Little's perfect landing spot would be the Miami Heat. For me, He's a guy who needs to get drafted by the right team to have a successful NBA career. The Heat would be that right team, but there are a lot of the places he can go that I think he would just flame out. Let's go to number 11. I'm taking DeAndre Hunter, the Orlando Magic, the small forward with Virginia Tech. Good two-way player, consistent, will fit well in the modern-day NBA. Reminds me of an Otto Porter. Can shoot from the outside, can defend multiple positions. Consistent, good player. If you're the Orlando Magic, I think DeAndre Hunter would be a fantastic player. You've taken Gordon. You've taken Bamba. You're going to let go of Vucevic. I know that the Magic need a point guard, but there's nobody on this list that they could really take and slot in there at the starting spot. Hunter would end up starting day one for the Magic. Let's go to the Charlotte Hornets. There's my guy, Bruno Fernando. In my opinion, the best big man in this class center-wise, not including Zion Williamson. The only reason to have him going at 12, he is having a great season so far, but I think he needs the tournament to up his profile a little bit more. Tons of offensive potential, a really good big man right now, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I think it'd be a great fit with, the, with Charlotte next to Bridges as well as Kemba Walker. Bruno Fernando is a guy for me. 
I think he's going to rise significantly over the next couple of weeks. At number 13, this might be a little bit of a surprise for some people, but not if you've been watching Gonzaga this year. Brandon Clark, for me, number 13 overall to the Minnesota Timberwolves. He is on the older side of things. He is a college junior. I know that those guys usually go late in the draft, like a Kyle Kuzma, but... Clark, for me, is a guy who is instantly going to equal wins in the NBA. A great two-way big man, can score in multiple ways, can't really shoot from the outside, but he's great down low. I think Julius Randle is the perfect comp for him. And if you put him on Minnesota, next to Carl Anthony Towns, the game that those two can have on the outside is going to be fantastic for the Timberwolves. They need guys who can equate to wins now. They don't need potential. They don't need athleticism. They need wins. And Brandon Clark will bring them wins and effective numbers on a night-in, night-out basis. Let's go to number 14. It's Nickel Alexander Walker, the shooting guard from Virginia Tech. Probably the best three-point shooter in this year's class, shooting close to 40% from outside the arc. I think he's going to be a really fun player in the NBA. He is everything that Kentavious Caldwell Pope was supposed to be. And I'm not just saying that because they both have crazy long names with hyphens in them. So he goes number 14 to the Detroit Pistons. Let's go to one of my favorite picks in this year's draft. Yes, the Lakers get the number 15 pick, and they take Ball Ball, the center from Oregon. One of the great sadnesses of the college basketball season this year is that we only got to see Ball Ball play nine games in college. But here's the thing. In those nine games, he was absolutely fantastic. He was shooting great threes. He was putting the ball on the floor and being able to actually cross up people. He was playing great defense. He was protecting the rim. I know he's really skinny and people are going to call him soft, whatever. The dude is 19 years old. He's 7'3 and can shoot threes. Nobody at his height should be able to shoot the way that he can. He, to me, is the next edition of the unicorn, like Jaron Jackson Jr. last year. I can't wait to see what Ball Ball is going to do in the NBA. And if you're going to say, what player could the Lakers pick that would actually be a good fit next to LeBron James? It's Ball Ball. It's a rim-protecting center who can shoot threes. What more perfect player to put next to LeBron James? I think it'd be a really fun pick. He'd be a perfect guy to slot in with the rest of those young guys that they have. And also, if you're calling the Pelicans, what better player to offer in a trade for Anthony Davis than, than Bull Bull? Not many better guys. So let me know in the comment section below, will Bull Bull be an all-star level NBA player? I want to say yes. I really do. I think his skill set is fascinating. I think his ceiling, I think his ceiling as, is as high as anyone in this draft minus Zion. Is that fair? Because I think Bull Bull can end up being a legitimately fantastic NBA player. So let me know in the comment section below if you guys think Bull Bull will make it to an all-star game in his NBA career. I say yes, absolutely 100% yes. If you guys want to make some money on the NBA this year, there's only one place to do it, and that's with our sportsbook partner, BetDSI. Head to chatsports.com slash bet. Use that promo code NBA120 for a 120% deposit bonus. Look, the NBA draft is right around the corner, as is March Madness. There's no better time to start gambling with, Bet with BetDSI than right now. Let's go to number 16. I know that some people are going to claim that Rui Hachimura should go higher than Brandon Clark. He is probably the, the quote-unquote better offensive player between the two Gonzaga prospects this year. But for me, I'm going to put him a little bit lower. I don't think he'll end up going in the lottery. He can't shoot from the outside at all, but he's a really fantastic athlete with a really good mid-range game. To me, Marcus Morris is the perfect, perfect, perfect comp for Rui Hachimura. One of the first Japanese-born players that will end up playing in the NBA. Yeah, I know, really interesting fact there, but I think the Nets are going to do great work with him. He fits a position in need. He's going to end up being the better version of Rondé Hollis Jefferson, who has not really progressed that well as an NBA player. He's going to fit in right next to Jared Allen, and I can't wait to see what Hachimura does in the NBA. He just has to get an outside shot. Let's go to the first of three Celtics draft picks that we will be getting over the next, like, 10 picks or so. Casey Akpala is a guy who I think the Celtics are going to target instantly. Consistent playmaker, exactly what they're looking for in terms of a shooter, good coachable guy as well. I think he's played a little bit under his pay grade with Stanford this year. I think he'd end up taking it to another level in the NBA. Ronnie Hood, for me, is a good comp for him, just with his ability to shoot from anywhere on the court. He's not a fantastic ball handler, and he's not a dynamic defender, but he's going to give you a lot of things off the bench 
if you're the Boston Celtics, who stand right now to lose many important pieces on their bench, including Terry Rozier, the likes of Marcus Morris as well. I think KZ Akpala will end up making up for some of their lost offense. Let's go to number 18 with the San Antonio Spurs. I have them taking Sekou Dumbia, mostly because I think the Spurs are looking for potential right now. Not really upfront skill. We know that Derek White is going to come back. Deonta Murray as well. They drafted Lonnie Walker last year. Now they need to start reinforcing their depth down low. Doobie is a guy who is incredibly, incredibly raw, but he has so much potential. I think the Spurs would be a great landing spot for him. Give him a year to develop and then move on from there. Let's go to Celtics pick number two. Trey Jones, the point guard from Duke and number 19 overall to the Celtics. Would be the perfect backup point guard behind Kyrie Irving, as well as replacing Terry Rozier. They already drafted Jason Tatum from Duke. Why not take another Duke guy and get Trey Jones? He's a good distributor. I'm not sure what his level of scoring will end up being in the NBA. Can't really shoot from the outside. Not a great finisher. He's a little bit too small, but he's going to be a great distributor and will be a good player to run your offense off the bench. Like a Fred Van Vliet or even a Tyus Jones, his brother, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Let's go to number 20. It's Kobe White. I don't know what his ceiling is. I really don't. I'm not really sure how good he can end up being in the NBA. I think he's going to be a good, consistent jump shooter. He's going to be a sticky player in the NBA. What I mean by that, he's not going to be a superstar, but he'll be in the NBA for a decade plus, play for a couple different teams, be a consistent shooter, and be a good guy off the bench. I don't know if he'll ever break a starting lineup. Maybe he'll be a really good sixth or seventh man. But for me, I like what Kobe White brings to the table. One of the better big school prospects we have this year, but I really want to see him in the tournament before I make my final evaluation on him. So that's our top 20 so far. We've got about 10 picks left to go. So without further ado, let's go to one of the most interesting players in the draft this year, Kevin Porter Jr., the shooting guard from USC. All the ability and talent in the world, all the potential, but all of the off-court red flags to deal with. Injuries this past year with USC, now he's suspended indefinitely with the program. We don't even know if he's gonna play college basketball again this year. For all the talent that comes with it, he has as many off-court red flags, which is why he's not going to end up as a lottery pick. But if you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, you already took Jared Culver at number three. You have a late pick now. I think Kevin Porter Jr. is the perfect guy for them to invest a little bit of draft stock in. Bring him in, see if you can coach him up, and try to turn him into the player that we all know he can be talent-wise. Just please keep this guy out of trouble. Let's go to number 22. It's Grant Williams, the power forward from Tennessee. One of the revelations of the college basketball season this year. He has been spectacular for Tennessee and one of the biggest reasons why they have been such a good team this year. For me, I think he's a perfect fit with the Trailblazers. They can, they need to stop taking projects like an Anthony Simons or, or a Caleb Swanigan who they just ended up trading. They need a dude who can come in and score instantly and end up making an impact Grant Williams will give that to him right away. Let's go to Celtics pick number three, and it's P.J. Washington, the power forward for Kentucky. Very talented player, can do a lot of different things, very versatile guy, good two-way big man. Here's the problem. I'm not sure where he's going to fit in the NBA. He's pretty slow moving, he's not great in transition, and he can't shoot threes. But if there's any team to put him on that can end up finding a use for him, it's Brad Stevens and it's the Boston Celtics. Though I will say this, this is a pick the Celtics will likely end up trading. They're not gonna end up drafting three people in the first round this year. Let's go to number 24. Look, the 76ers need a actual point guard on their team that isn't TJ McConnell. I love Ben Simmons. I think he's one of the best young players in the NBA. But the 76ers need a pure point guard, someone who can shoot and distribute as his backup. I'm not a TJ McConnell guy. I'm really not. Shamori Pons would be a fantastic guy to back up Ben Simmons with. He can shoot from just about anywhere. He's a very good playmaker. He can run multiple different offenses. He's been with St. John's now for three years and has performed very well for Chris Mullen, the head coach there at St. John. I'm a big fan of his. I like Shamori Pons, and I think he's a perfect fit with the 76ers. Let me know in the comment section below who has a brighter future. Give me a C for the Celtics. Give me a 7 for the 76ers. It's tough. This offseason is really going to decide it for us. Can the 76ers keep Jimmy Butler? What will they do in the draft this year? Will Kyrie Irving stay with the Celtics? Will they get Anthony Davis? Lots of things to decide. 
but let me know in the comment section below where we stand today. Let's go to number 25. We have the Oklahoma City Thunder. I have them taking Jonte Porter. It, it, look, didn't have a great season last year playing with his brother. This year, tears his ACL and MCL. Now we have no idea what he's going to be like after the injuries. His whole family has a history of knee problems. But if you're the Oklahoma City Thunder and you're 25 and you're looking to take a little bit of a chance on a guy, I think Jonte Porter is the guy to take a chance on. He can slot it perfectly for them at the four. He really does match up well with the rest of the guys they have on that roster. Long, athletic guys like a Terrence Ferguson or a Jerry and Grant. Jonte Porter fits right in with those guys, and I think it would give him a great place to rehab and come back from that injury with, without a lot of expectations on him in year one let's move on here to our next pick and at number 26 it is ty jerome the point guard from virginia i'm not i'm trying to be as nice as i can about this but he really is he is this year's white guy who can shoot he really is last year was dante divincenzo this year it's ty jerome and if you're the if you're the indiana pacers who as of right now stand to have a pretty huge upheaval of their point guard spot ty jerome is a good place to start I don't think he'll ever actually start for you, but he'll be a great shooter for you off the bench. He's shooting 40% from outside the arc, and he's only shooting 42% from the floor in general. He's a pure three-point shooter. He's going to go late in the first, and I think the Pacers will be a great landing spot for Ty Jerome. Let's go back to the Brooklyn Nets at pick number 27. They actually get this pick from the Denver Nuggets in the Kenneth Three trade. And I'm actually going to have the Nets taking a Kenneth Fareed style player and Eric Pascal, the power forward from Villanova. A good rotational big for a playoff team. I think will fit very well in the system that Brooklyn and Kenny Mackinson has tried to create over the past couple of years. Or Kenny Atkinson, excuse me. Imagine a Brandon Bass kind of player. Can bang it down low, can rebound as well. Has a good mid-range jumping game as well. He's a good combination with the likes of Rodi and Karuks and John Amusa down low for the Brooklyn Nets. Eric Pascal, your Villanova player of this year's draft. Let's go to the Golden State Warriors at pick number 28. Remember, they do not have the best record in the NBA, so they get stuck here, not with the last pick in the draft. I think Daniel Gafford would be an absolute steal for the Golden State Warriors. Fantastic culture guy. He's a senior at Arkansas, or excuse me, a, a multi-year player at Arkansas right now, a former SEC uh, All-American, excuse me, a former All-SEC player. I'm a big Daniel Gafford guy. I think he's going to fit right away into the NBA. A good rotational big man. Reminds me a lot of Jared Solinger a couple years ago before he got way too fat and couldn't play basketball anymore. If you're putting him on the Warriors, remember, they stand to lose both DeMarcus Cousins and Kevin Durant. I think Gafford would be a good guy to bring in. Give him some minutes next to Jordan Bell. Let him score. Let him play off the post and allow him also to distribute from the post and also for the top of the key. He's done some great things with Arkansas over the past couple of years. Do not be surprised if Daniel Gafford ends up skyrocketing draft boards as we get closer and closer to the NBA draft. Let's go to pick number 29. It is Charles Bassey, the center from Western Kentucky. One of the highest potential guys in this year's draft. There's just one problem. As of right now, he's not very good. To me, he's like Mitchell Robinson. You could really coach him up and turn him into a fantastic player, but if you don't give him the right coaching, he's not going to be very good. And of course, what better coach than Greg Popovich? How about Naz Reed at pick number 30? We're at the end of the first round here. If you're the Bucks, you're looking for potential. You traded Thon Maker. Naz Reed does, or Naz Reed, excuse me, does have low, a lower ceiling than I once thought, but I think you give him to Mike Budenholzer, you let him play at the center spot, maybe you teach him how to shoot a little bit from the outside, and I think Nazarene could end up being a pretty fine player. Let's go back through my mock draft here one more time. Zion Williamson at number one, then RJ Barrett, Jared Culver, John Moran, and Cam Reddish finishing out our top five. Into the rest of the top 10, Romeo Langford, Jackson Hayes, Keldon Johnson, Darius Garland and Nasir Little there going at number 10 in the Miami Heat. After that, DeAndre Hunter, Bruin Fernando, Brandon Clark, Nikhil Alexander, Walker, and then Bull Bull there going to the Lakers at number 15. Rui Hachimura to the Nets at 16. Couple Celtics picks here of KJ Akpala and or KZ Akpala and Trey Jones with Sekou Dumbia in the middle there. And then Kobe White finishing out the top 20 into the playoff teams. Kevin Porter Jr., Grant Williams, P.J. Washington, Shamori Pons, and Jonte Porter as the 25th pick in the draft. And then into the last five picks, Ty Jerome, Eric Pascal, Daniel Gafford, Charles, Bath, 
Charles Bassey, excuse me, and Nas Reed.